Well, we are going to look at Romans 1, and I thought we would just do, as we prepare for the Thanksgiving holidays, a little theology of Thanksgiving. I want to make sure you've got a good theology of Thanksgiving. Um, and so, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, we're going to look in verse 8, where, where Paul gives thanks. And I will tell you, it is Paul's habit in all of his letters uh, to begin by giving thanks. Now, he doesn't do it in all of his letters in uh, the... Um, uh, letter to the Galatians, because I think he's kind of mad. <laughs> he sort of skips uh, being thankful. Uh, in the letter to the first Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, there's no thanks again. I think because Paul's mad, uh, so he's uh, moving on into um, uh, to some instruction for them. But but it is Paul's habit uh, to be thankful first, and and even in the location of this utterance of thanksgiving, we need to be reminded. Paul, uh, Paul's going to say first. Uh, first, I thank my God. And so, let that even be a lesson to you. Is thanking the first thing you do? Is, is thanking the way you start your day? Is it the first thing on your mind? Because it needs to be. What, what is something that's useful about starting with gratitude? Why, why is gratitude a good place to start your, your thinking and start the way you, you engage the world? Why is gratitude a good launch point? And there will be a lot of audience participation tonight. So just go ahead and warm your brains up a little bit. Why is Thanksgiving a good place to start? It's a yeah, I, I think it's just on a fundamental level, it's instead of choosing negativity, contempt, grousing and grumbling, which I don't know about you, but the, the more grumbly I am, the more grumbly I get. You know, it has a sort of a gravitational pull downward. And so it's, 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 it's looking up instead of down. All right, why else is Gratitude, a good way to start. Because we're all so tremendously blessed. That's right, because it happens to be true that there's, especially for those of us who are in Christ, there's never a time not to be grateful because what we are in possession of is exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. And so it's, it's true. Now, so what's the opposite of gratitude? Ingratitude. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in, in, well, very good. Ingratitude. Thank you, uh, Brent, uh, for that incisive uh, observation. Uh, and what sort of behavior accompanies ingratitude? What, is, what does someone who's ungrateful look like? The Grinch. Just the Grinch. It, in fact, that's very good as we head into the holidays. It's just a frown and, and down and, and nitpicking and um, convinced that uh, that the thing that that's gets creating all this negativity in them is not their fault. They deserve more. Uh, other people should have known to do better. Uh, they should be at a different place than they are. And none of that's true. None of it's true. What's true is we should be glad to be alive. It's a miracle that we're even here. The fact that your mind functions is a, is a gift and a and a. You don't even know how all of that works. And so it's true. Uh, anything else? Why, why is gratitude a good place to start? Well, I just wanted to say um, there's no coincidences in, uh, with God. And it just happened on a couple of weeks ago. I saw something on YouTube where the, a priest was talking about uh, Mother Teresa had said to him, um, it's always good to say good morning, God, or good morning, Jesus. And so I've been trying to remember that, and some days I forget. But this morning I said, good morning, Jesus. And, and I told Adrian later on in the day, it has been such a good day today. And I think it had a lot to do with mm -hmm. saying that, because he said it will change your life, saying good morning to Jesus. Uh, my mother yells, good morning, Lord, every morning when she gets up. And why don't we just agree, maybe for the next couple of days, uh, that that's how we'll start. Uh, there's power in the name of Jesus. Do you believe there's power in the name of Jesus? I don't really know how all of that works, except I know that there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in, in naming things. Make sure you're naming things properly. I think that's part of what being grateful to start with is. You're naming your day. You're making some claims about the day. You're going to go ahead and say in faith, where your attention is going to be. Because it the other thing is it really is a choice. 
And really, you have a choice when you wake up. You can wake up and say, good morning, Jesus, or you can wake up and say something ugly, you know, you, and then there you go. It really is a choice that you make on the front end, and it really is going to set the direction of the rest of your day because it's going to guide you uh, in your focus. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So, so, Romans chapter 1, verse 8 Paul writes, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And what you have in that verse and in the three movements of that verse are really the three dynamics of your gratitude. It's the three things that ought to root and, and ground your gratitude. We need to make sure we're thankful for the right kinds of things. And these, this one verse gives us these three areas uh, where we need to have an attitude of gratitude. And what this verse is going to help you do is correct a problem that very often uh, infects the way we think about being grateful people. Uh, very often, what, when I say, what, what are you thankful for? Very uh, often, what's the, what's the first thing you talk about when, you, when you're talking about what you're thankful for? My wife. Very good, Jeremy. You get bonus points for that. Yes, the Sunday school answer. <laughs> Typically, we give thanks for things. We give thanks for, for, for things. I think one of the things you, uh, you find with Paul, uh, we, we, and we'll get to this, is Paul's always thankful for something other than things. And so a lot of times our, our gratitude is not what it should be because what we ask for uh, or uh, things having to do with things, uh, things that are focused on us instead of God, things that are, we, we, we're grateful for things instead of people, and then thirdly, we're grateful for circumstances instead of kingdom advance. All right, so we're grateful uh, when something good happens to us, but uh, that's reflective of a, what I call benefit theology. Grateful not for who God is and the fact, just the fact that He is, but we're really more thankful for what God does for us. We feel great about God when the things He gives us are things we want, and then not so much if uh, the things that are going on aren't what we would have chosen. And so a tendency to think about us instead of God, a, ten a tendency then to think about things instead of people, uh, things that we can possess, and then finally, uh, tending to, uh, to be thankful for circumstances that are uh, well suited to our happiness, but not so interested in whether or not those circumstances have anything to do with kingdom advance. Are we willing to be people who even accept difficult circumstances if those difficult circumstances are going to be that, which, that through which the kingdom is going to expand? Are we more interested in the advance of God's kingdom or our own personal comfort? And so Paul helps us get oriented the right way about gratitude. So the first aspect of a, of a good theology of thanksgiving is, is that thanksgiving is fueled by a focus on God. I thank who? who, does, who does, who's Paul thanking? God. And what specifically? What does he say? What's the little word before God? I thank my God. I thank my God. How? Through Jesus Christ. That is just... Paul is able to take a whole lot and cram it down in just a few words. But if you want a real nice, tight definition of how to give thanks, that's the way to do it. My God. What, what does it mean that Paul says, my God? Why, why is that significant that he adds that little pronoun in there? What does it say about God? Personal. It's personal. He's not some far off being and we sort of toss these little gratitudes up there into the sky the man upstairs that sort of thing but 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 our God is a God who is personal he's he's near he's close to us he's paying attention he's deeply involved in what's going on and he wants to know us in a personal way and then the rest of that part of the verse how is it that God is able to be near to us through Jesus Christ all right, through Jesus Christ, this way has been made for us to know God in a, personal, in a personal way. What do you know about Paul's conversion? Since Paul is able to pray to his God through Jesus Christ, he's a, he's a follower of the Lord Jesus. And what do we know real quickly about, about 
uh, Paul's conversion. Did Paul grow up in a Baptist church and, and, and walk the aisle at an early age and, and trust Jesus and get his RA pen and, and um, it's just, it just had an easy time? What was, what was Paul's, what's Paul's story? Face to face, and and where was Paul headed? Damascus. To Damascus for a for the for the Damascus Baptist Convention. <laughs> no, what was Paul heading to Damascus for? Verse three, to verse kill three. Christians, to kill Christians, to drag them back to Jerusalem and do to them what he had seen done to Stephen. He'll say later in uh, First Timothy, "I'm the chief of sinners. I am sinner." Number one, I killed Christians. And yet God found a way to save him. God found a way to save him. God found a way to do something about the, this terrible debt that Paul owed, owed this terrible wall uh, that had been built up between him and God. Paul was headed uh, away from God 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. And what did Paul think he was doing? doing with respect to God's will when he was on his way to Damascus. He thought he was in the center of God's will. He thought he was in the center of God's will. He thought he was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing and he was completely wrong. I think that had something to do, I, I think that encounter with Jesus blinded Paul because the, when, when, when he finally realized just how wrong he was, I think it cracked his brain. I think it that literally blinded his eyes and then the glory and the beauty of Christ uh, uh, it was a collision with Paul that, that changed everything. And so what Paul's going to do in the rest of Romans is he's going to lay out the gospel. He's going to lay out the problem and its solution. And so in Romans 1, in just a few verses, what are some of the things that, that Paul is going to say about the human state of affairs with respect to God? Without, without Jesus or before Jesus, what's our situation? as described in Romans 1 and into Romans 2. It's bad. No one is righteous. No, not one. Our, our feet rush to do evil. We celebrate uh, when things are gone wrong. We look for ways to do wrong. We get bored with, with our wrongdoing and have to come up with new ways to do wrongdoing just because uh, we're, we're, so, uh, we're, we're experts at it. We take everything good and have twisted it around backwards and we're in a desperate situation. And, and God sends... Um, the Jewish people and, he's, and it's going to be this way of rescue and then the Jews blow it up and so not only was the ship sinking but the rescue boat sank and it just looked like a desperate situation and then in Romans uh, chapter 3 verse 21 the, the first point that good news pops up but now but now apart from the law but now apart from this mess that's been created and exacerbated by the law. But now, God's righteousness. And what God's righteousness is, and I want you to get grooved in on this, it isn't merely God, uh, the, the, the rule maker and rule keeper. But, but God's righteousness has to do specifically with the promise that he's made to, to restore the world. It's God's covenant commitment to put things back together. And God has this very difficult task. How do, I, how do I judge sin and punish sin and still have anything left uh, to redeem once judgment has fallen? And how does God solve the problem of our sin and His promise to, uh, to put everything back together? How does God keep that promise? Through Jesus Christ. There you go. He finds a way in one man... To, to deal completely with sin and open completely a way of salvation. Uh, Paul will say later in Romans, oh, oh the, oh, the uh, amazing greatness of God, uh, that, that he would be able to, uh, the wisdom of God, he could figure it out how to save somebody like me. And so, Paul was constantly ruminating on the greatness of his salvation in Christ Jesus. He'll say in just a few verses, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And so 
Paul was constantly blown away and overwhelmed. He, he just never got over how good God had been to him in saving him through Jesus Christ. In 1574, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in the Netherlands, a town called Leiden, a, a, a long siege had been taking place. The, the, the Spanish had laid siege to the city of Leiden in the Netherlands. Just about the time they had choked the city out, the, the Spanish left. And the city, instead of rebuilding and recovering and restocking and supplying, they just assumed that the problem was over, the Spanish were gone, and they could go on about their business. They got warned that the Spanish were returning, they didn't do anything, and then those, that great armada showed up and laid siege to the city again. And months and months go by, everyone is starving to death, there's no hope and there's no help. And then, miraculously, a storm hits. And it, uh, that's a low, the Netherlands is a low-lying area, and the place where the Spanish had set up their camps flooded. Um, an unusual level of flooding, and the, the, uh, the, 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 the army that was laying siege was inundated with water themselves. And a little boy went out uh, early one morning uh, out from the city to see what was going on with the Spanish, and they were gone. They were just gone. In fact, he... Part of, the, part of the story was he brought back a warm pot of stew that was still warm from a fire. That's how quickly the Spanish had left. And when the news went out that suddenly and miraculously and due to nothing on the, the part of any of the people of the city, their certain death uh, had now been turned to victory and to, to redemption. And so for, that was in 1574. 400 plus years later, on October the 3rd, they remember the exact date, uh, they have a great celebration of this freedom. And they eat bowls of, of uh, uh, porridge and they share um, white bread and, and herring fish because that's what was available after the siege was over. And they celebrate that redemption every year. They've never gotten over it all these hundreds of years later. That needs to be our attitude. I think so Many of us, it's a, it's a struggle often in my life, is we, we, we got saved, but we just got over it. You should never get over it. And you start your day just by having the right kind of focus on the greatness of God's salvation for you. And then you can go on from there to talk about God's faithfulness over and over again, above and beyond uh, even His salvation of you. Uh, and even if you're going through something hard, I think it was Charles Spurgeon who... who taught that uh, even when you're going through something hard, you can say these things. First of all, I'm going through something hard, but it could be worse. I'm going through something hard, uh, but uh, others have it harder than I do. I'm going through something hard, but it's a whole lot less than I deserve. I know what I'm going through is hard, but God's not finished yet with what's going on. And so we ought to have a theocentric idea about God's a greatness and his activity in our lives. Dante Gabrielle Rossetti said, it's got to be the worst feeling in the world to feel grateful and to have no one to say thank you to. We all have, every human being it has a sense of there being something more. But those of us who are in Christ, we know who to thank. We thank Jesus Christ uh, and, and uh, the one who is our Lord and our God. So you need to have thanksgiving that is fueled by a focus on God. And then secondly, thanksgiving that is fueled by a focus on people. So once you finish praising God and thanking Him for who He is or for what He's done, then you can thank God for people. First, Paul says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you. For you. It was Paul's, as I've already shared, it was Paul's propensity to thank God for people, much more so than to thank God for things. And he is thankful uh, for their love, for their progress, for um, uh, what, how, how God is using them, for God's provision over their lives. In fact, if you want to do a study of Paul, you can study all of his letters and all of the places where he says thank you. There's all kinds of good stuff in there about how Paul thanks God for people. Uh, uh, Paul came to recognize one of God's greatest expressions of love for him after his salvation through Jesus Christ is the gift of people to him. Um, do you think Paul was an easy person to hang out with? I get the sense not. I get the sense he was a, he was a difficult person, very passionate, very committed. He's uh, probably type A, 
um, he was accustomed to um, uh, opposition and sometimes you can see in, in some places it looks like even there wasn't any opposition he'd just go find some you know and so I think Paul was probably somewhat a, a, a difficult person and yet he deeply needed people almost throughout Paul's ministry especially in the book of Acts it's Paul and somebody else who are some of the ands that go along with Paul Paul and Silas Paul and Barnabas John Mark, Timothy, and then on to Titus, uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, um, Apollos. It's interesting for someone who on one level looked to be difficult to get along with, he always had a buddy with him. He always had someone and it tended to, it looks like people who were maybe a bit more positive. And so you have Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Timothy, who seemed to have a gentle spirit. And I think Paul knew he needed some sweet around it to balance his salty a little bit. Paul needed people. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, do what God had called him to do on his own. In fact, he says in uh, one, of the, uh, one of the prison epistles, uh, First or Second Timothy, um, I'm, I'm all alone here. And, and he was really discouraged. O only Luke is with me, I think is what he says. And, and he needed uh, people to be around him. Um, uh, Onesimus, the slave. Uh, all throughout, uh, and then of course in most of Paul's letters, they, they, uh, they conclude with these long lists. Be sure and greet Marcus and Archippus and you know, 16, 18, 20, 30 people uh, that Paul would thank at the end of his letters because he needed people. He wasn't going to make, make it without them. And we need to be grateful uh, for the people that God has put in our lives. A man named William Stidger, a pastor, was, was uh, serving a church in America in, during the Depression. And um, we've gotten a little taste of what it's like for our problem to just go on and on and on and on. But COVID is nothing like the Great Depression. It just went on and on and on, year after year, and it just ground people down. And so William Stidger was at a, a, a meeting with some other pastors, and they they were all thinking about quitting. They, they, when they thought about trying to prepare another sermon in the midst of the Great Depression, they all just decided, I don't think I can write another sermon. I'm just, I'm on E. I, I, I don't know how we're going to move forward. And they got to talking about that and then made a choice about Thanksgiving and they decided that what they would do is reach out to someone who had blessed their lives in their past. And so William Stidger sat down and he wrote to a teacher and he wrote to a, a mentor, a pastor mentor uh, in his life. Just a few days he got return letters and, and the teacher said, uh, your letter has been such a blessing to me in my later years and during my retirement, the loss of my spouse, these have been lonely times. And she says, I gotta tell you, of 50 years of teaching, you're the first letter I've gotten from a student saying thank you. And it has meant the world to me, I read it every day. And then the uh, mentor pastor, I had just lost his spouse. And he said, when I got your letter and read it, I got up to tell my wife. And I had to remember again that she had gone on to be with the Lord. But that letter has meant so much to me. Uh, it's, it's been a, the greatest gift of the year to me. Thank you. And what Pastor Stidger came to understand is that that gratitude for one another started to have kind of an updraft. It, 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 it sparked more gratitude and it became sort of these rippling waves of gratitude as we started to think, as he started to think about God's great and, and um, voluminous gifts of people. The depression had gotten them thinking about their loss of things. But they had not lost these people. And so I would encourage you during this Thanksgiving season, why don't you sit down and think through two, three, four people who played a critical role in your life at a critical moment. And, and uh, uh, the internet, for, for all of its faults, it is easy to find an address. And why don't you send a couple of letters over, over Thanksgiving and just say, I don't know if you know this, but you, you intervene. I'm gonna, at a critical time in my life, I'm going uh, to reach out uh, to a guy named Mike who had a I, who who when I was the most discouraged I've probably ever been in my adult life Mike stepped up to the plate and I got to thinking about it today because it's been some time you know, I've had the, 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 the benefit of years um, I don't know if I would be in the ministry 
I, it sort of hit me today as I got to thinking about how, how much of a difference and how low I was at that time. He played an unbelievably critical role in my life. And so you've all got stories like that in your life. And so send a couple of notes and thank God for, for the people uh, that God puts in your life. Make sure that in marriage and family and church, your Sunday school teacher. And, I, and let me say this, by the way, I don't, don't want to be quick to go past this. I receive letters and cards from you all all the time. So it's, it's been uh, categorically different than anywhere else I've served. And of course, I've loved everywhere I've served, and folks have been great. But y'all are letter writers. Y'all are card writers. And I keep them. Okay? I, they, they mean the world to me. And you, we can sort of get through anything. If you can get a little gratitude every once in a while, man, I'm telling you. Uh, it, it has an amazing effect. And so Paul understood that, and so he knew how to thank God for these people, who, by the way, he's never met. He's only heard about them. And yet he's thanking God for them. And we need to have that same kind of focus as well, thanking God for people. And then finally, um, th uh, thanksgiving is fueled by a focus on God. Thanksgiving is fueled by a focus on people. And finally, thanksgiving is fueled by a focus on the kingdom, a focus on the kingdom. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. The best thing that Paul could think of to thank God for these people is that the Christ in them was making a difference in the world. He's not thanking these people because they sent a, a love offering or did something nice for him. He's, the best thing he can be grateful for in their lives is that God is using them uh, to bring good news to other people. Here, here's what I got to thinking about today as I was studying this. Um, I'm not sure how much Paul knew about what else was going on in, in the work of missions in, in, the, in those early days of, of the church. He, he knew what was going on in Antioch and he, he had his little plans, but it might have been news to Paul. So he's in Corinth. When he first went to Corinth is when he meets Aquila and Priscilla. Y'all follow me on that? So Aquila and Priscilla had been kicked out of Rome because Claudius had kicked all the Jews out of Rome. And so Aquila and Priscilla have left Rome and they've gone to Corinth. And then Paul has gone to Corinth on his second missionary journey. And they meet. And it might have been news to Paul to find out that there was a thriving, growing Christian congregation in Rome. That had been started likely by Jewish Christians who had gotten saved at Pentecost. They were on pilgrimage to do Passover, and they got saved, and they had gone all the way back to Rome, and had just started churches uh, there in Rome. And I got to imagine that Paul was unbelievably encouraged that already work was going on in the in the the New York City of the world at that time was Rome, and the influence of that was going out from uh, from uh, going out in every direction from the church there in Rome. And so I know Paul was thrilled. And then Paul recognized the opportunity. The book of Romans is, is written because Paul wants to transfer from Antioch to Rome to do the second half of his missionary life. He's, he says later on in the book of Romans, I've done everything in the East that I want to do. I've done everything in Asia Minor that I want to do. And I'm just going to shift my operations west to Rome and Rome is going to be my Antioch. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave and return and leave and return and leave and return. And so I've heard so many great things about your faith and the strength of your church that I believe this is the, this is the could be my launch pad to go on to Spain, uh, uh, to, to go uh, on into uh, Western Europe. And so he sees in them already a passion for the kingdom, a passion for the, for the nations. Uh, Paul has a kingdom mindset. Uh, if, you, if you read in these early verses, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. What's an apostle? Here's your, here's your pop quiz. What, what, what does the word apostle mean? Anybody know? Very good. Uh, an apostle 
typically, and it get, there's a little fluidity in, the, in the, the standards, but typically an apostle had to have seen the risen Christ and been commissioned by the risen Christ. Apostle means sent out. And so what Paul knew is someone who had laid his eyes on Jesus and been called and sent by him, that he had one mission, and that, and that was to make the name of Jesus known, especially among the Gentiles. And that was his passion, and that's what he wanted to see happening uh, in the lives of, of other people. And so he could be thankful because the work is going on. Here's another reason why you ought to be thankful tonight. All over the world, the gospel is being preached. Isn't that just crazy? After 2,000 years and unbelievable persecution and opposition at every turn, it's going on. And, and I think Paul in the early going struggled. I, I hope this catches fire. I, I hope it, it moves on in the, in the, into the generations. And so Paul is so thankful that it, it changes lives. It, it can even go in. And what was significant about Christianity being uh, something that's growing in, in the city of Rome. Why is that a big deal? Yeah, that's, because that's just where the Caesar is, man. That's, Caesar called himself Savior and Lord and God. He believed himself to be divine and he, and he used the term Savior and Lord. And so to go into Rome and say... Jesus of Nazareth, this Jewish peasant who dies in a backwater province of the Roman Empire, he is actually kurios and soter. He is actually Lord and Savior. That was an act of sedition. And yet right there, underneath Caesar's nose, the church is growing. And it, it, and it cannot be stopped. And Paul is absolutely thrilled. Another reason why you need to be thrilled. You need to be thrilled because you're saved. You need to be thrilled because you've been given a family of faith. And you need to be thrilled because the gospel can't be stopped. And in Sri Lanka and China and, and Eritrea and, and uh, 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 um, the United Arab Emirates and places where it's not even legal. Uh, Iran, one of the fastest growing movements of Christianity in the world is in Iran. Can you believe that? People are getting saved like crazy. And we ought to be thrilled about that uh, because it cannot be stopped. A um, young man named Charles Fulton Orsler uh, was, was a child in the, in, the, in the early 1900s. Grew up in a home. Uh, dad was an agnostic. Uh, mom was not interested in spiritual things. He had no spiritual upbringing of any kind. But there was a little housekeeper. He was in the, in, uh, lived in New York, and they had a little housekeeper named Anna. And uh, as a little boy, Charles remembered Anna would fold her hands and put them on the table and, and, and say, um, much obliged for the vittles. And finally, one day, the little boy Charles said to Anna, why, why do you say that? And she says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying thank you to the Lord for, for providing the food. That's what vittles are. It's, it's for the food. And Charles said, well, you'd, you'd have that food whether or not you said thank you or not. And Anna said, I, I suppose that may be true, but the food just tastes so much better when it's eaten in gratitude. And that little boy filed that away. He didn't really know what she meant, didn't know what all that was about, but like little kids do, he just sort of filed it away and grew up, had no interest in spiritual things, married a, 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 and, uh, a lady that was a lapsed uh, Catholic and, and they just uh, had children and were living their life and for so he was a journalist and had an opportunity to go to the Holy Land and in the Holy Land as often happens he got more than he expected and started to have an interest in spiritual things and started to write he was a journalist and started to write a history of Jesus and he figured that he would get back to the United States and it would wear off you know, this interest in Jesus would, would, would wear off, but it wouldn't wear off. It, it, uh, it had changed him. And eventually he would join the church and write a book called The Greatest Story Ever Told that was turned into the movie The Greatest Story Ever Told. And his children got saved and his grandchildren were saved and they wrote several other Christian books together. But all of that impact of that story and that writing and the movie and the people who've gotten saved because of that movie and translated into all these different languages was birthed by a little expression of gratitude. Dear Lord, much obliged for these vittles. And he learned through 
seeing real biblical gratitude with the kingdom of God was all about. And that's, that's how it works. And so we need to do a searching inventory of God's attributes, a searching inventory of God's gifts to us through other believers, a searching inventory of all the ways and places that God uh, is, is working even now. We're going to do a, a blessing of the shoeboxes on Sunday. And we're going to send, I think we're a, a thousand, we're over a thousand, over, over a thousand shoeboxes are going to go out from First Baptist Fairhope to who knows where, all over the world. And, and kids are going to hear and see the gospel and their families are going to be exposed to the gospel and communities are going to be changed and we can be very thankful that God includes us in that work. So, we need to have the right theology of thanksgiving. We have much to be thankful for and we need to be quick to praise God and thank God for these things. I hope you'll have a good theology of thanksgiving in the coming days. And you'll share this good news with the people that God puts in your life. And you'll tell some folks thank you uh, in this coming uh, week for the way God has used them. And you'll just spend a little time in these next days thanking God. Uh, as Jake used to do when he was a little boy, he would say, thank you God for God. And so uh, spend a little time just thanking God that he is. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, we are thankful. We have so many reasons to be thankful. And it does need to be at the top of our list. It does need to be a priority. Just like it was for Paul, let it be so for us. It's the first thing we do. It's the first thing on our minds. It's the first thing we think about when we, when we think about you. It's not what we need you to give us, but that in Christ Jesus you've already given us everything. And so, Lord, we pray that you would send us from this place as people filled with gratitude. That'll look different in the world in which we live where people are so down and discouraged and uh, convinced of, 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 of the rotten lot they've gotten in life. Lord, the world needs grateful people to go out into the world with their eyes on you and your goodness and your saving work that's going on. That'll be a blessing to little eyes who are watching us, little ears who are listening to us. What are they hearing us say and seeing us do as they sit next to us at the dinner table? Help us to reflect the gratitude that you're due. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great evening. See you Sunday.